my task today was uh, to present to you some issues that are, we are confronting today uh, with destruction. Issues that have a, clearly a technical nature, as uh, we have seen through the presentation of SIARC and their work, uh, but issues that have a clear uh, political nature, as we see every day, and as we also uh, see uh, in the action that the international community is trying to develop to uh, expand, let's say, uh, recently uh, to face what has become uh, you know, a, a plague of contemporary times, the destruction of cultural heritage. Um, I will tell you a little bit what's happening also uh, in these very days. Uh, we have had uh, just a few days ago at UNESCO the executive board adopted uh, I think what is an important decision to which will be moved now to the general conference in early November to um, reinforce the activities on the ground. Uh, this is something not easy to, to do, but certainly something that we need to, uh, to move on uh, through the creation of special uh, forces, using, of course, services of the existing uh, services in partner states, uh, in order to uh, improve uh, you know, the prevention uh, sometimes even the protection of uh, heritage uh, in case of conflicts. I think it is, uh, you know, the international community saying, essentially saying enough for what we have seen. We have just seen examples of destruction of uh, uh, very important sites in Iraq. I will show you a few more uh, in other parts of the world. Now, the, the idea that, we, uh, that I have is to essentially discuss what are the tools uh, and what are their potential, the potentiality, and also the limits. Um, uh, it goes without saying, and I'm not going to be hypocritical, that I, I really think that there is a big gap between uh, what we see today in the field, the destruction, massive destruction of sites that have enormous value for, for humanity, and the tools that the international community was able to develop in the past uh, 50, 60 years uh, to face this, uh, this threat. Uh, this gap is, is very serious, uh, it's not, uh, and it's probably not acceptable anymore. This is why you know, there's been uh, not only from the uh, governmental level a push to have more tools, but also, as we can see here, you know, the uh, civil society has uh, moved on and has created tools, has created uh, initiatives, has created organizations that can work together with the governmental organizations in order to uh, you know, limit the, uh, the disasters that we see on, every, on, on a daily basis. At the same time, I think <coughs> it is important to understand uh, the nature of what we see. We cannot understand <coughs> what's happening if we don't look at history. Um, history has, has, been, has, has offered us uh, many examples of destructions, uh, many examples of uh, uh, annihilation, or what we now call heritage, maybe at that time it was not called heritage, but you know, let's remember that you know, for thousands of years, uh, in the endless wars that men have unleashed against each other, um, the symbols of culture, the symbols of religion, the symbols of the other, uh, uh, of the enemy or of the other community uh, have been attacked, have been destroyed. Uh, of course, I don't have the time today to go into now, the long history of this, but now, let's remember that we have in our own, uh, you know, history, uh, history in our, in our own DNA, this destruction uh, of, of the symbols of the other as one of the sad uh, dimensions of human existence. We have to understand that very well. At the same time, at some point, let's say in the past uh, 100 years or so, um, modern societies have started defining heritage. Uh, as a concept, as something that we consider part of our own uh, culture, of our own uh, uh, policy, of our own daily existence. And at that time, uh, at that, it's at that time that we uh, can see, when call, can, can we, we can call that heritage destruction. Uh, so I would like to focus today on what uh, we call today heritage destruction, see how deep it is, has been in our culture, and why certain important uh, tools that reflect an important uh, attitude of uh, the international community in all its forms uh, have come to, to existence. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the, the, uh, 
uh, what we see today, this is a, for a picture of Aleppo, you know, is uh, on a daily, on a daily basis we see on the papers. But uh, you know, destruction of heritage started long ago, as I said. You know, you, we have examples coming from the past. Uh, long, this is a, a painting illustrating the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, for instance, which the Romans, of course, were the first thing the Romans uh, went after, you know, and when they took uh, Jerusalem to substitute it with their own symbols. But in Germany, you know, this is a, 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 a 16th century uh, Dresden uh, Kreuzkirche was destroyed in, during the Seventh uh, Years' War. So we have a lot of examples uh, of that. Uh, clearly, the, in modern times, the starting point for destruction of, of heritage was the French Revolution. French Revolution was a, you know, leveling the old order, and by leveling the old order, they wanted to destroy the symbols of it. The first one was, of course, the Bastille to go, but then they started destroying all the churches. That is the famous Cluny uh, Abbey that uh, was essentially dismantled and, and sold for stone until they realized, and the French realized, that they were destroying what was, in fact, the heritage of their own people and, and, and the value uh, and the uh, and, and the value that was attached to it. So, in fact, at that time, there was a, a taking of consciousness that heritage needed to be protected, even if it was inherited from another culture, another civilization. And that, this is why in the 19th century we had this important development of uh, heritage culture. Uh, with its own tools, so the, the, uh, the first experiments that we had in re reconstruction and, and conservation, and of course the, 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 the philosophical and technical approach that we still use today. Heritage became uh, under attack during uh, when when wars became became uh, industrialized. So World War One, which by the way we celebrate this year, you know, the, in these years actually the hundredth anniversary, was the first moment in which we can we will see destructions that are similar to the one we we see today. Um, it's not been shown very much in these. Uh, in these uh, years of remembrance, but in fact, a lot of cities that were you know, on the uh, edge of the confrontation, at the, at the center of the confrontation, uh, like Arras, for instance, you know, were completely leveled. Uh, this is the, the city hall of Arras, and look at what happened to Ypres you know, in uh, northern France, which was essentially turning to ruins. This is the church, uh, the cathedral of Ypres, and the famous uh, uh, cloth hall of Ypres that you see in a picture before and after the destruction. So unfortunately, World War I was not just a massive destruction of uh, man, and, uh, but also it started what uh, you know, was, went on later on in World War II uh, as a massive destruction of cities and, and, and heritage, very often targeted per se, not just because of their military value. But really, to be very explicit, the, uh, the worst uh, in this field, in this area, happened in World War II. Because it is in World War II that heritage, per se, became a target of attack. Of course, we all remember the first uh, big destruction. This is uh, <coughs> the bombing of uh, Coventry, uh, <coughs> the first city to be uh, destroyed in, uh, in, in World War II by a massive uh, uh, air attack. Um, of course, the, 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 the exchanges between the British and the Germans had started already, but at that point, the Germans decided to do this um, very fatal uh, you know, attack, which, you know, of course, was destroyed you know, very important parts of Coventry, including the cathedral. You can see Western Churchill here visiting the ruins after the bombing, and you can see you know, how they turned into uh, a museum, a sort of a shrine, uh, by leaving uh, the ruins as they are. A bit like uh, you have done here in Berlin with the Friedrich Kirche in, uh, in, uh, in the center. Um, of course, this was just the start. Then, of course, uh, in, the few, in the following years, 1942, for instance, we had the opposite. Uh, uh, Lubeck was very, very heavily uh, bombed by the Allied forces. You, know, you can see here pictures of the destruction of Lubeck. Uh, 1942, and it was at that time that the German command, the Nazi uh, regime, decided to uh, retaliate in what is uh, ha happened to be known as the Baidecker raids. They took the Baidecker and they said, you know, every city with uh, more than three stars will go. And they started bombing England uh, with many, many cities. Exeter, for instance, no, attacking from, from Normandy. Uh, Exeter was, was bombed, uh, Bath, 
a very big bombing of Bath in the in the this is a painting actually you see, you see the ruins here near one of the crescents uh, and Norwich and many others so we have about uh, 10, 10 uh, big raids on English cities now, of course at that time 1942 the start the war started you know as the pendulum started switching and Luftwaffe was not as powerful as it used to be and um, by 1943 they had lost uh, you know most of their attack capacity and so you know at that time it was when the Allied forces really decided to uh, not only retaliate but you know, hit Germany at the core and over a thousand cities were destroyed in this uh, in this country at that time uh, of course I cannot show many but you know every, every major city you can imagine from Hamburg to Köln uh, <coughs> to, uh, was was uh, essentially destroyed uh, Berlin is of course was the first one bombing several several times you the images of Berlin in 45 are very famous uh, just going very quickly on, on that but what was left here of the, of the capital of Germany was very little uh, to the point that in fact it has been thoroughly reconstructed uh, afterward as we as we know um, the case is of course the Schloss that is the Schloss of the, uh, the Kaiser in the center this is before the destruction you can see it and this is uh, after the war 1945 when it was still standing uh, although quite damaged as you can see but probably could have been uh, fixed or restored if it wasn't the fact that another power, the Soviet in that case, decided to hit it as a symbol of the uh, ancient, uh, the old regime. So in 1951, they decided to dynamite uh, the, uh, the Schloss uh, and to build on its, in its place a palace, which was called the Palace of the Republic. Uh, you, see, you see it here in the two stages it had, you know, as a full-fledging palace. It was a conference center, essentially. And then when it was essentially dismantled and turned into a, a skeleton uh, to be essentially uh, removed. And now we have, of course, as you all know, the reconstruction of the old palace. So this building is, symbolizes <coughs> a lot, I think, uh, in terms of, of, of the transition and the pendulum of history, although, you know, a lot of discussions on, uh, you know, conservation and reconstruction can be done around this, uh, this operation. Uh, of course, as we all know, the most disastrous one was the bombing of Dresden, you know, the fire bombing in uh, February 45 <coughs> that essentially destroyed and annihilated the city. The city was completely uh, burnt and uh, to the ground with a very large number of fatalities uh, comparable uh, to, to, to the ones that were created by the, the atom bombing in, the, in Japan, actually, around 60, 70,000 people died in those <coughs> two nights, um, and, and very little is left, as you as you know. Dresden only has today, uh, you know, a facade, which is uh, on the one on the Elbe River, but the rest of the city has been completely uh, uh, changed, and it's a modern modern town. And this is essentially what you have a comparative comparatively in 1945 and today. Uh, so Germany was really the one that suffered more in terms of you know destruction of its uh, heritage. Um, uh, of course, we cannot go into any discussion of responsibilities and so on, but I'm just giving you the facts of what happened. The rest of Europe also. Uh, we have very important cities like Warsaw, for instance, which were literally turned to, the, to, to nothing. Uh, you see a picture of Warsaw in 1945, and it looked, <coughs> it looked essentially like this. They've done a major effort of uh, reconstruction, perhaps the biggest effort or reconstruction of an entire urban complex. Uh, you can see here before and after the cities of, uh, of Warsaw. Uh, I think it's a very interesting case of, uh, of uh, how a city can actually you know, be redone according to uh, existing records. Probably not as exact and precise as the one that uh, Sayar can provide, but certainly uh, uh, they had records that were based on paintings, and Belotto and others, and of course on architectural drawings and so on. So they did a, <coughs> a major effort on reconstruction. This is uh, an important case, mm, I would say perhaps the most important in terms of the scale, but not the only one in terms of reconstruction. Reconstruction has been you know, a very common operation in, uh, in the post-war. Um, in Italy also we had very important discussion. I think, think that I can go only to one example, which is the famous Abbey of Monte Cassino, which you know, was the theater of a major bombing strike uh, air raids um, <coughs> aimed to target, to, to target um, you know, military commands, but I think you know, in reality they were not such an important, uh, it was not such an important uh, military target, but it became a target and you see what happens uh, 
of this very important medieval uh, uh, abbey, which was in an isolated place, and now, of course, being rebuilt and so on. So <coughs> you see, wars have been sometimes very blind on this, um, on, uh, on, uh, on heritage. Although we have some notable examples, some counterexamples. For instance, and let's not forget that Kyoto was not destroyed, although you know, Tokyo was destroyed, Kyoto was not destroyed. Uh, let's not forget that Venice was not destroyed. Venice was uh, essentially the capital of the uh, fascist uh, um, government after 1943. That's where most of the activities were taking place, but it was not hit. So there were sometimes, you know, some some restrictions and some uh, <laughs> some limitations in that kind of destruction, but very limited case. Now the other force for heritage destruction in the 20th century has been the revolutions. We have several revolutions, of course, starting with the Russian Revolution, which, like the French Revolution, tried to you know, destroy the, uh, many of the symbols of the previous uh, regime. Um, fortunately for St. Petersburg, the capital was quickly sh shifted to, to Moscow, so St. Petersburg survived uh, quite well the transition from, uh, <coughs> through the revolutionary times because it was not, uh, it was not the capital. But in Moscow, uh, where the new regime established its, uh, its, uh, its headquarters, on the contrary, many things uh, happened. And of course, the first enemy at that time was the church. So I would like to show you a case of the destruction of the St. Saviour's Cathedral in, uh, in, uh, in Moscow, which is, as you see here in a Google map as, as it stands today. In 19, the 1930s, it was first looted by the Bolshevik troops and then dynamited uh, by, by them uh, in order to create uh, space for the construction of the great palace of the people. Uh, you see this uh, important <laughs> architectural design with a big Lenin statue on the top, which was to, supposed to be the, uh, the palace of the Communist Party <coughs> of, uh, of Russia. Of course, uh, in the 1930s, there were economic uh, crises, and then the war came, so this palace was never built. In fact, they, only the foundations of the palace were built, and uh, when I saw it in the 1970s, it was a large swimming pool actually heated swimming pool where we could actually take a, a swim even in the winter and it was a very popular place but of course the palace was not was not built now after the uh, end of communism and during the Yeltsin uh, presidency uh, the church was rebuilt uh, exactly on the site and exactly on the shape it had. So this is another example of a of reconstruction after the revolutions are, are ended. The other big revolution, Chinese revolution, uh, which uh, for 10 years, and not, not as much a revolution per se, but the cultural revolution, which went from 66 to 76, was really, really, really heavy on heritage. Uh, it was almost, for the Red Guards, almost a duty to destroy burn and, and, uh, and <coughs> uh, the, the examples, many examples, statues, paintings, uh, buildings of the, of the ancient regime. You can see on the top, uh, the top cartoon is the, the fight against the Bat Gang of Four, for instance, you know, and the people are walking over you know, the symbols of the, ancient, uh, of the ancient past of China. Uh, and many, many things were done. I, I, uh, I know that the Chinese today resent very much and, uh, this period. Uh, the amount of destruction that was done in those year, 10 years is ab absolutely appalling. Uh, it, it accounts for almost 80% of the heritage of China, so it's really very, very big. And certain regions like uh, Tibet and others have suffered more than others. And you can see many examples of this uh, you know, fury that you know, devastated uh, China's heritage, unfortunately, in almost a non, non repairable manner. But these are conflicts of the century. But then we have a lot of contemporary conflicts. This is not over. Unfortunately, wars are with us. Uh, we thought that you know, wars could be ended uh, after World War II through an international action, but and perhaps we have succeeded in ending global wars, but we have not succeeded in ending local wars, regional wars. And I would like to give you some examples. What I like to, to warn you that these are just few, few examples of the many, many, many conflicts that have ravaged our, our, our planet in the past uh, 20, 30 years and are still going on as we uh, have seen uh, just now and uh, you will see also <coughs> in some of my images. 
Um, we had, for instance, very major serious <coughs> damages in the, in the, in the <coughs> Southeast Asia. Uh, that was, as you know, ravaged by the Vietnam War first and then the occupation of Vietnam of the Cambodian uh, land. And during that occupation, which lasted quite a long time, the site of Angkor, which is a World Heritage Site, uh, very uh, of major importance, uh, this one you see here, it's one of the largest in the world, um, was really suffered a lot. We had an enormous amount of looting, uh, of course uh, uncontrollable because it was under, you know, there were militias, there were um, you know, robbers of all sorts, and you know, a huge market, huge, yeah, Angkor is, is, is really big, really big, so it has thousands and thousands of statues that can be, as you can see here or in this one, defaced, you now like had truncated and sold into the market for, for years and decades. This market in, 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 uh, in the Southeast Asia was uh, you know, nourished by this um, you know, illegal, illegal trafficking of, of cultural objects. Uh, these are the feet of one of the statues which actually was recently given back to Cambodia, but you know, it's a special case uh, of restitution uh, from the Metropolitan Museum actually in New York. Um, special case of restitution, but the majority of the uh, heads and statues and, and um, decorations that have been looted uh, and sold in the market are lost uh, forever. Then we had a season of wars in the Balkans with the Moster Bridge, a you know, very famous uh, bridge that connects, in fact, two communities of different religion, and it was built in the, in the 16th century. Uh, very interesting architecture and engineering, engineering prowess was bombed, was deliberately uh, 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 destroyed by a militia uh, to exactly symbolize the cutting of this uh, connection. And of course, there was for some years a passerelle, like, like you see here in this picture, and then through a uh, joint effort of many um, uh, governments and UNESCO and the World Bank and so on, uh, it was finally rebuilt in the modern, uh, in the modern situation, this modern shape. So it's, it's a very, very important symbol of, of this conflict. The Sarajevo, well, Sarajevo, as you know, was for two years was, you know, under bombing. This is the library of Sarajevo, uh, was burnt, and we see a violinist violin here, you know, uh, playing like a, a Rostropovich did it here in, uh, in, uh, in Berlin, in the, in the ruins of, uh, <coughs> of the library. Um, Dubrovnik, uh, Dubrovnik was bombed for three months. Uh, these are, you know, these are maps of all the damages. And, you know, a militia was just sitting on the top of the, of the hill and bombing the city. This is a World Heritage Site, uh, by, by the way. Um, so, you know, just to show that you know, international protection sometimes has limits, you know, because even a World Heritage Site can be... These are things that happened 20 years ago. And not, uh, they're not from a, from a distant past. They're 20 years ago in Europe. There was a war that really damaged uh, in <coughs> uh, heritage and, of course, uh, brought uh, many other you know, um, destructions to people and to, to cultures and that we all remember. So it's not something very far. That's what I, I want to uh, express very clearly, that these dangers are not something that belongs to the other or very far in history. They are very close and they you know, things that can happen. Then, of course, we had uh, in the year 2000 a very defining moment, I would say, because with the destruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas, uh, the world took really, you know, consciousness that, you know, these monuments are very fragile, very exposed, and they can disappear. And things that have been there for 1,500 years, you know, can just be blown up in a, in a moment by a group of crazy people like we see uh, today with the ISIS. So what's left of the Buddha is uh, just the niches, as you can see. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion, of course, on what to do, but you know, to reconstruct a, a carved stone that was turning into dust by, by dynamite uh, is not so easy. Uh, so for the time being, you know, we have done, uh, under the leadership of UNESCO, we have done uh, essentially the consolidation of these niches. You know, with the, it's a very interesting uh, operation you know, in order to uh, prevent you know, collapses of these niches, but then we'll see in the future what uh, will happen. Um, we have many other conflicts that sometimes are forgotten. Remember what's happening in, uh, in Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, it's an area that uh, still you know, has not found uh, a good uh, compromise, a good balance. You know, there is a hidden conflict that sometimes emerges, and uh, we, we have very often the, 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 the proof of it. Uh, very often, you know, for instance, this is a, an Armenian cemetery in. Uh, in that region, uh, this, in this region of Azerbaijan, which is, as you 
can see here it's, a, it's an enclave here that belongs to Azerbaijan. And this, this monastery, this uh, cemetery was uh, destroyed a few years ago, which in 2002, and uh, with a uh, great uproar, of course, on the Armenian. Uh, this is, uh, on the contrary, a, a mosque in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. That, uh, that is the, the area where the Armenians are, you know, are, are, um, have, have conquered there years ago, and it's the center of this conflict, uh, which was also destroyed. So it's very difficult to say whose uh, who's, who's responsibility, and this is not my, my, <laughs> my task, but certainly you, know, you have examples from, from all sides. And very often, these have a religious component. Now we see that also happening today. Uh, if you remember just uh, 20 years ago in Ayodhya, which is a uh, you know, very important uh, uh, site for Hindu people, but where the Muslim uh, during the 500 years of occupation or, or living that they had in India built a very important mosque. This is actually a mosque built by uh, Babur, no? one of the first Mongol uh, <coughs> emperors. And in one day, uh, you know, a mob of uh, uh, Hindu fanatics, <coughs> fanatics uh, went there and essentially demolished uh, the, the Ayodhya mosque. You know, they turned it to the ground. So it's a very, very, you know, uh, it's a very serious attack to, to a heritage form and expression, and it was really sorry. I'm really sorry that we were not able. They were not able in this case to find a kind of a, you know, agreement, a compromise, because the two shrines, in fact, very often, you know, can live together. Uh, but we see that the religious uh, fury is happening all the time. And uh, by the way, just this week we had this destruction of the. Uh, Joseph Tumba, you know, remember, in, uh, which you can see here in this picture in its early stage and beginning of the century. And this is the, the current situation somehow in the middle of houses. Then you can see it being burnt uh, just uh, days ago. Um, so religious is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is another dimension that very often comes about in this, uh, in this conflict. Well, heritage is supposed to be a protection of the international community, uh, but it's true that very often it fails. One of the failures, for instance, was the case of Privy here, you know, the temple in uh, uh, Cambodia that was inscribed in the World Heritage List, although it was, you know, the, the, uh, the temple didn't have a very clear border because there was still a uh, negotiation going on for 30, 40, 50 years between Thailand and, and Cambodia on the on the border of the, of, of, the, of, the two, of the two states. And this fell in the middle. You know, it's, it's actually located, as you can see, in, right there in the, you know, in the border of Thailand and, and Cambodia. And, and unfortunately, the, the, the exact border was not defined. So we had, you know, after <coughs> the inscription, the conflict, which was looming there for many years, uh, came to the surface. And we had many clashes, at least two, three, three occasions. And so, some, some people died also in this situation and the temple itself was uh, was um, uh, was actually damaged because there were shells and bullets that hit it uh, and of course having a world heritage site you know <coughs> occupied by <coughs> military forces is not exactly what uh, uh, the scope of the world heritage convention uh, was <coughs> from the beginning so we have many situations that you can see sometimes refer to political conflicts, sometimes to open wars, sometimes to religious conflicts, and unfortunately these have accelerated <coughs> in the past, uh, in the past uh, decades. And today we have <coughs> many of these. Unfortunately, I would say too many, so it's very difficult even to understand where this will go. But in the past just few years we had <coughs> so many examples of destruction that we are now really concerned and worried about the, the very role that international institutions should and can and should play. Uh, we had a case of Tumbutu, as you know very well, this is just uh, three years ago when the city was uh, occupied by <coughs> a militia uh, or fundamentalist. Uh, and they, they were Muslim, of course, so they did not touch on the very important uh, mosques. This is the Sankara Mosque in Timbuktu, a World Heritage Site. Uh, but they did destroy all of the mausoleums that were attached to uh, the mosques or, or, or located in nearby <coughs> cemetery because uh, you know, their version of Islam did not uh, allow you know, this form of uh, say, uh, or worshiping or, uh, or at least uh, <laughs> celebration to be, to be done. So in fact, all, all of these mausoleums which were in, in the World Heritage List were, were gone. 
um, together with some a little part, fortunately, of the other important uh, heritage of uh, Timbuktu, the, the manuscripts. And now, fortunately, after they were ousted of the city, we were able to do it very quickly, you know, an intervention. And I would like to uh, to let you know that all of these um, mausoleums have been reconstructed now. They are in new form, as you can see there, before and after, in two or three examples that we have done. We've done the job for this, uh, because it was possible, and <coughs> the place was pacified, and we were able to, you know, re re to use also local capacities to rebuild the entire thing. Then we have Aleppo. Uh, Aleppo was, I think, uh, I, I want to like to mention this because, as you know, yesterday a, a new military campaign has started, which is targeting Aleppo <coughs> for essentially the Syrians. The Syrian government wants to reconquer it. So I think that we will see, unfortunately, in the coming days, you know, more uh, distractions and problems. Uh, the situation is, uh, uh, I think, it was partially illustrated by my the one that person spoke before me on Iraq. Uh, this is the Syrian version of the same. And the ISIS, as you can see, is on both sides. But the, clearly the destruction of the minaret of the Umayyad uh, um, uh, mosque of Aleppo, as you can see in these two pictures, was a very, very one of the most shocking examples of uh, you know, how a deliberate destruction uh, <coughs> was done, because there was no, of course, no need of destroying a minaret. Uh, the citadel also has been touched a little bit, but certainly the greatest destruction that happened in the souk, in the bazaar of Aleppo, which, as you said, not only was bombed, but also burnt. <coughs> so this is a bazaar of the you know, 16th century, which has gone forever, as you, as you can see, and is turning into, into rubble. Um, and then we have the case of Palmyra, which is the most recent one. Uh, just going very quickly, because you know that very well, we have Palmyra has a huge value for, for archaeology. It's one of the most symbolic sites in the world. And then we have, of course, the, this area, which is the valley of the tombs. Then you have the two major temples, the Temple of Baal Shamin, the Temple of Bel, and then you, the Triumphal Arch. Well, all these elements that I put on the map uh, have been destroyed now. Uh, the first to go was where, uh, you know, of course, the Summer Temple, but these, these are the tombs uh, of the Roman times. Uh, very beautiful, uh, just outside of the, <coughs> of the city area. And you can see in this area picture, this is the existing situation before and now to what's left here. You see that many have gone. These, these two, two, one and these two ones have gone. And we, of course, they, they, we can expect the rest to go also if the, the ISIS continues doing what has been done doing so far. Um, this is the other group. You see the Ella, Ellen Bell tomb and the Tenatan tomb, all both of them destroyed. And they destroy them with dynamite, so it's very, it will be very difficult to, to do something uh, later on because they're not just collapsing, you know, they're just really blown up. Uh, the Temple of Baal Shamin, which is of huge, uh, of huge importance, you can see this is uh, the Zenobia Palace. Here is the temple before, and that's the temple after. You see a very major explosion that has blown up the entire, the entire structure. This is the temple before, and this is actually during its. Uh, uh, mice, and this is a picture of what's left today uh, of, the, of the situation. And the Temple of Bell, which is even bigger. Uh, the, this is a huge you can see, temple of the classical times, uh, again also blown up uh, with a very major, <laughs> very major uh, uh, attack. And you see what's left. This is the temple before, and what's left just a little, this little two, uh, two columns uh, there. So, as you can see, this is a you know, complete annihilation and symbolic thing that happened just two days ago, the destruction of the Palmyra Arch. Now, this is this uh, arch, the Triumphal Arch, gives entrance to the big colonnade, uh, was also blown up. Uh, you can see, this is actually the only picture that was, uh, got, got, went out of, of Palmyra. You can see the, you know, it's very bad, but you can see that the arch has been uh, taken down. Other parts of the Middle East also are, you know, suffering. Uh, we have many, many distractions. Maybe you speak less about Sana'a, but we have many, many distractions in Sana'a. This is a map of the government that shows the amount of um, buildings that have been, you know, uh, destroyed during bombings in recent times. Uh, things like that, you know, very important buildings of this jewel of world heritage. Uh, like that, so they're very, very fragile. They're made up of earthen architecture, so you know a bomb can that can do a lot of damage. And unfortunately, recently we also had the bombing of a very important um, ruin of uh, Barrakesh, you know, which is you know uh, <coughs> not very I mean same in, in the central region of 
uh, of Yemen. It's very, see a very old ancient uh, fortress here, and the uh, the temple of uh, Nakra, which is you know was uh, re reconstructed by Italian archaeologists in a very interesting uh, form, was actually actually collapsed uh, due to a bombing, which you know we don't know yet how it happened, but uh, certainly. You know what's there? Uh, it shows that even archaeological sites in the middle of the desert can become targets uh, uh, of, uh, <coughs> of destruction. Now, the question after this depressing uh, presentation is: What can be done? Uh, what can we do? Well, I would like to show what we have, and what we have, as I said from the beginning, is not enough. There is a big gap uh, between the needs and the and the and the and the, and the, and the tools that we have available. But we have a convention. We have a, an international treaty. Uh, signed by a number of countries, about 140. Um, not all of them, eh? by the way, you still miss some, some big ones. Um, which is the, the Intergovernmental uh, say, Treaty for the Protection of Cultural Property in the Event of Armed Conflict, 1954. This is really a son uh, of World War II. This is the, what they, you know, the governments came up after. It's, it's the first uh, cultural treaty uh, ever. Um, building on previous, uh, say, agreements that come back uh, to the end of the 19th century, but this is actually a, 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 real, a real treaty. And unfortunately, it's, uh, it's uh, first of all, not signed by all the countries. Uh, secondly, it's a uh, you know, relatively um, toothless, I would say, it doesn't have you know, tools, because it's all, it's all based on a kind of an elegant form of war. You know, when there is a war, a government calls the other government and declares war, and that point the treaty if, they, if both are signatories come into effect. But you can imagine that this is not the form of war that we have today. They're not elegant, and they're not uh, uh, sometimes even done by uh, formal, formally existing uh, states. So it is really not the most appropriate. Uh, but certainly, it's what we have, and it's good, very good for, especially for training because it mobilizes armed forces of the signatory governments to train other armed forces or other experts into the, the protection of cultural property. So I think it's a very useful tool for you know, developing capacities and so on, but certainly, you know, again, it's not the one that can save the situation in a critical moment. Uh, in the recent years, because there have been many local conflicts in the Middle East and many other parts of the world, many armed forces, and this is a case for the US uh, armed forces, have taken stock at them, and they understood that they have to have more capacities. I think it's a very important say, step forward, because if those capacities are embedded in the, in the armies, you know, it's much, much easier than to do things to avoid risks, to prevent uh, distractions, and to uh, establish you know, protective measures during uh, moments of, uh, of conflict and so on. Um, we also do a lot of things that you know can be useful for those armies. Uh, when the uh, when the Mali conflict became hot, you know, and there was a military uh, reaction, which was done by the Malians and the French uh, to free to move to, we published this little passport, which is a little little document that stays like in a pocket, uh, in <coughs> which was intended to provide information to the troops on what is cultural heritage, so that they could know that the mosque is a mosque or something like this. Um, and then we have, of course, uh, networks for the, uh, the international, uh, for the protection of museums, very important. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, protecting museums and rescuing uh, objects before uh, they get sacked or they get destroyed, it's very important. And that's what happened also in Syria, where most of the um, big national museums have been uh, emptied by, by the national authority, by the antiquity authorities, and uh, they have been preserved in a way. But you know, you have to do. So you have to have training. You have to have um, means. You have to have uh, rescue places. I mean, it's something that has to be prepared. Um, as I said earlier, UNESCO is now launching this idea. Uh, it's called the reinforcement of UNESCO Action for the Protection of Culture. This is a resolution that was approved uh, just a few days ago and will go to the General Conference. Let's see what the General Conference does <coughs> in terms of supporting this, the idea that you know, there could be more interventions of specialized forces attached to, to military in case of, in case of conflicts. Um, 
somebody calls it a blue helmet or culture, but I think it's uh, not the, the right term. But anyway, it's, uh, it's, it, will, it will be something else. Uh, we have uh, also a, a new actor in the scene, which is uh, the International Criminal Court, the Tribunal for Crimes Against Humanity, based in The Hague. This is uh, uh, very important because they have in their, in their statute uh, the possibility of prosecuting crimes against uh, uh, cultural heritage. And the first trial, I'd like to announce, the first trial will take place next year against the, those who have destroyed the mausoleums in Tubutu. Now, a company to destruction, very often you have looting, and you know, as, as the scholars have uh, explored very, very thoroughly, this looting is not done by poor people on the ground, the peasant that doesn't have you know, some, anything to eat. It, they are done by organized crime or uh, linked to chains of uh, dealers and traders of, of, <coughs> of uh, arts and very often supporting terrorist activities. So very, uh, we, when we say the ISIS finances itself by selling objects, it is true. That's what they do. They loot things, they steal things from museums and they sell them. Um, so there is a, a connection between all these you know, issues and all these issues that we're discussing and the fight uh, against terrorism. And of course, uh, the impact of these activities, uh, illegal activities, has been dramatic. You know, the, uh, uh, the, this book called The Rape of Mesopotamia. This is what happened in Iraq, actually starting not only the, the, first, the second, but also the first uh, war in 1981. Uh, practically all the major archaeological sites have been destroyed by illegal, illegal digging. And I think you've all seen also pictures from Syria everywhere, uh, Apamea, Ebla, Mari, etc., etc., etc. We have a convention, which is the convention for uh, the fight against illicit traffic. I think it's very important. Again, not signed by all the countries, around 25 or something, so we still miss a lot, uh, but it's the one that you know, we have, uh, and that's, that's the only tool we have. And it's uh, something that, in fact, uh, has been, m I would say, more uh, operational than the other convention, than the 1954 convention, because it is based, it has the support of uh, another, uh, say, piece of treaty, the, the Unidwad Treaty, which operates on markets, and has the support of the Interpol. Also, the police is, uh, has a database and can intervene and so on, and can help uh, uh, you know, limiting illicit traffic. Uh, you remember that recently the Security Council has also issued a, a, an important uh, decision that you know, blocks uh, stops and uh, declares illegal the trafficking of objects from, uh, from the uh, Middle East. Uh, but again, these are you know, intentions, so then to make it into practice you have to be much more operational. So, um, as you can see, it's a bit gloomy. It's not, uh, it's not a very good uh, situation. We have more damages than we can you know, uh, prevent. Uh, we have less tools than what we need. And this is one of the reasons why UNESCO is supporting so strongly the action of SIARC and the action of all the other uh, expressions of civil society that can help uh, the member states, uh, uh, the local managers, uh, those who have responsibilities for protection of heritage, helping trying to limit the damages in these very difficult times. Thank you very much.